Welcome everybody to this month's episode of DevSecOps Live. DevSecOps Live is brought to you by Practical DevSecOps, where I happen to work. We're a product-based company focused on DevSecOps education, consulting, training at the moment. And DevSecOps Live is about sharing the knowledge that we acquire through our consulting and training programs. Also to bring in people that are very active in this field of DevSecOps to share some of the experiences that they have been gaining and some of the changes and influences that they've been making in the security industry. The session is recorded, which means it will be available in our YouTube channel right after the webinar is done, probably in a couple of days. We have also done previous episodes about threat modeling, product security leads, privacy modeling, and many other topics. So check out our YouTube channel. Also stay tuned to our LinkedIn pages. With that said, today we have Brian from CloudBees, the company CloudBees. As a highly accredited IT executive, Brian is currently helping the Department of Defense embrace DevSecOps at CloudBees. CloudBees also happens to be the company behind the open source project Jenkins. Who doesn't know Jenkins after all? Continuous integration is synonymous with the word Jenkins. Brian has also been associated with the company Denim Group, who are behind the product ThreatFix, a vulnerability correlation deduplication on aggregation platform. And with that, I will let Brian introduce and speak for himself a little bit. And I'll give the floor to you, Brian. Good luck and enlighten us what Software Factories is all about. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come to talk to everyone today on I think this is an interesting topic. Uh, so just a little bit of background. I appreciate that introduction. I've been in the industry for over 20 years. Um, started in the late 90s doing web design and spent a good uh, portion from 2003 to 2017, really focused around uh, core, what I call core IT services, a lot of cloud migrations, a lot of Office 365, SharePoint design. Um, and then in 2017, I really started focusing on cybersecurity and DevOps. Um, kind of the two merging is DevSecOps. I um, had the opportunity to uh, work with a number of different organizations over that time, really helping them um, do everything from build out pipelines to pin testing, threat modeling, um, a number of really cool things. Very community focused, I volunteer a lot, um, be it for uh, you know, open source projects. I support Hacktoberfest, which is a project in support of Jenkins. Um, I work for the Emerging Leaders Group for a number of organizations to really help build leadership and skills uh, for up and coming talent that's coming into organizations. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, just a quick high level overview on some context. I do work at CloudBees now, as Marin mentioned, CloudBees is the enterprise company behind the open source project Jenkins. We contribute 85, 90% of the code to that project. Um, you know, CloudBees was created by developers for developers with this Jenkins heritage in place um, and really um, showing that we can take this, this capability. Typically, large organizations will look at um, who have all made significant investments in showing up their product environments. So we really like the idea of this open platform where you use the tools that you've already invested in. As you know, that's what Jenkins is really well known for, having a large integration plugin ecosystem. So having the ability to bring in those tools you already know and love, um, and then kind of extend that out, really looking at how can we offer end-to-end -end software delivery. And so I work with our Air Force and Space Force customers to help them achieve those goals of continuous delivery. Um, how do they modernize existing systems? How do they start to move to cloud-native platforms? And our CloudBees really helps them support them in that journey, right? So with that, We'll kind of dive right in here today. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to put them in the Q and A or in the chat. I'd be happy to answer those questions for you. Uh, and if you have any follow up or feedback, you know, definitely let me know. I think this is kind of an evolving topic. I mean, software factories have been around for for some time, but they're really kind of gaining traction. And I think the way that the DO Department of Defense, the DoD, the Air Force uses them kind of unique. So organizations today must really develop technological solutions capable of responding quickly and efficiently to customer demands while offering the best experiences possible. This new digital paradigm really gave rise to the birth of software factories, 
Software currently plays an important role in the development and evolution of organizations. We look at the importance of software for organizations as it relates to optimizing tasks, increasing profit, reducing costs, minimizing times. In other words, making operations easier and therefore enhancing strategy and competitiveness. So what is a software factory in that context? A software factory is an organized collection of software assets, tools, and processes and highly motivated and skilled human resources that expedite the production and delivery of software solutions. And I wanna point out that I mentioned highly motivated and skilled uh, human resources because when you take this software factory approach, you end up creating a pipeline of talent that are gonna come into your organization and probably go as they upskill, which is okay, but that needs to be accounted for in the competitive landscapes organizations find themselves in when it comes to talent acquisition, right? And so you can, as long as you plan for this, I think you can really create a nice uh, model where you're bringing in talent, upskilling them, giving them opportunity um, to move on and really be able to drive that value for your organization, your customer. The factory approach is modeled directly off traditional manufacturing techniques. I mean, there's not a lot different there. Where a collection of tools alongside a well-designed process eliminates waste throughout the product life cycle. So in the software world, this means eliminating redundant activities, uh, minimizing unnecessary manual tasks, and maximizing the value derived from the developers. The number one requirement to accomplish these goals is really automation, right? And think about traditional manufacturing. Automation is what really drives a lot of that. And in the traditional factory, the assembly line connects the processes, tools, and people required to produce those high-quality products. Similarly, a good software factory requires that automation connect the same processes, tools, and people into high-functioning pipelines to deliver software that's always deployment-worthy. And we'll talk about kind of deployment quite a bit today, and I have some resources and takeaways, I think, that you can leverage depending on you know, how much continuous delivery, continuous deployment you do today. So a common term for this approach, right, is DevSecOps. Um, that's what we're here to talk about today um, in the context of the software factory environment. So the software factory development approach leads to significant benefits. Uh, a few of them that we're gonna kind of go through as we talk today is a shorter time to market. So that's gonna allow a reduction budget for development. Um, custom enterprise software development starts to transform from these fixed cost projects to variable cost projects, which can have some benefits to it. Let us kind of iterate early, decide if this thing is worth pursuing or not scenarios. The standardization of the software development across all the development teams starts to reduce development errors and re does result in a higher quality and consistency. And we've got some examples of that we'll touch on today. Standardization in a fixed technology set further allows uh, the reduction of training time of the resources um, for development and maintenance because we've made this very repeatable. And then it allows a direct focus on our clients' objectives um, more so than over the life cycle of development software products, because we can really start to focus and, and narrow in on what their needs are. And then agile and quick adaption, adaptation of the software factory approach based on the client, the, client, the client requirements and features through that development life cycle. So again, kind of really iterating closely with those, with those organizations so that we make sure that we're getting that good feedback. And a lot of times these can be like software factories can be like an outsourced service, right? Like almost like a shared services group. They may even have, depending on the organization, and I'll give some examples here in a minute, they kind of can offer different types of services. Some may be more platform, some may actually be offering you developers that you can assign projects to, to build out your applications. So some of the characteristics of the software factory today Really, agile is at the core principle of the whole operation. So the ability to be nimble, responses, should really permeate through the development process. This generally means that we would be collaborating in ways that we never have before, particularly when we look at the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense, the Air Force, federal government tends to be very siloed. Um, information sharing is difficult because of different access levels, um, different security permissions required to see and access information. A basic but fundamental pillar that we talked about earlier, again, goes back to automation. So this saves a lot of time in our prototyping, development, testing, the refinement of the products we have. And all of this translates into creating greater value to our customers. A software factory needs to be customer-centric to be successful nowadays. This means focusing on providing um, 
the use our customers with great experience. And this should be the number, really the number one business priority of the factory. Insights gleaned from that ongoing customer feedback are really the fuel that keeps the factory moving so that we have a um, good feedback. We can really progress what we're offering. We also need to consider security in this. Customer today, customers today demand high security standards. Many times software factories develop programs and applications that are going to handle sensitive data, especially as it relates to the this kind of the space that I'm in. But you look at that from, you know, fintech, um, healthcare, you know, all of these heavily regulated industries, this is going to be very applicable. Um, the information can be key to the company's, the sensitive information can be key to the company's operations, uh, even to its strategy. And so we need to look at how do we secure that. We actually, and what we'll take a look at next is the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation actually just released the Secure Software Factory Reference Architecture. That kind of helps us look at how do we need to, when we're standing this up, how do we need to deal with the security portion of this? And um, what does that really look like? CNCF defines software supply chain as a series of steps performed when you're writing, testing, packaging, and distributing application software to end consumers. So the software factory is logical construct and aggregating this that facilitates the deliver of software. And when it's done correctly, it ensures security is a key component of that application delivery process. So the CNCF, Secure Software Factory, SSF guidance, it builds on a couple of their previous publications, um, such as the cloud native security best practices and their software supply chain best practices um, reference architectures. The reference architecture really emphasizes the ability to use existing open source tooling with that emphasis on security. So this isn't, you know, go out and buy a bunch of commercial products to be able to do this. It's really focused on how do we start to set that framework out there with open source tools that are available and then insert your favorite commercial product when, when needed, right, to suit your, your organization's needs. And it really kind of this whole software, uh, secure software factory reference architecture really rallies around four overarching principles that you'll see if you go read the white paper, um, each of which is really required to ensure that software delivery is secure from the inception to code to production. So one is going to be looking at the defense in depth, right? Like how many layers do I have to my environment to protect it? What type of signing and verification am I doing across assets? We'll talk about this some more later when we start talking about the supply chain portion of this, um, when we start looking at things like S-bombs, artifact metadata and analytics, um, and then automation, right? Coming back to that automation pillar that we've already talked about and touched on several times. So you got to remember that this SSF reference architecture isn't focused on areas such as code scanning, really. I mean, all of signings mentioned this particular document doesn't really focus on that. Instead, it really takes a deeper focus on code providence and build activities. And so the rationale for this um, was that the focus on the downstream activities such as like static and dynamic scanning are reliant on validating the provenance and the identity of the party you're receiving something from, um, that trusted entity. Um, these identities may be tied to a human user or a machine, and really the combination of that signature and validating that is coming from a trusted source or key to the assurance of the provenance. So again, it's, it's more around that trust layer than it is the specifics of scan results. Um, now, whether those, uh, those entities are related to the broader organizations like identity access management systems, source code management tools, or downstream, the SSF framework really itself is dependent on for the attestations, the signature of artifacts that your downstream consumers are using. Um, so next, in support of the automation pillar, let's take a look at, um, at minimum continuous delivery requirements for a software factory before diving into some examples, just to further kind of lay, lay the groundwork of what we have here today. Um, just a second. My here's my nice uh, screen froze here. Okay, actually, okay, here we go. So we're actually gonna we are gonna look at some menu some continuous uh, delivery requirements, but actually first I want to go through the examples so you can kind of understand where these are 
where these kind of ideas are coming from. So again, this talk is really focused on software factories in the DoD. Uh, so this is kind of my comfort zone. This is the area I've been in playing in for the past five years. Uh, I've been actually part of a number of these key programs almost since their inception. We'll, I'm not going to go through all of these, although I do have case study or use case information on all these software factories. So if you have any follow-up questions or want to dive into any of them specifically, have, you know, reach out to me, happy to talk. Uh, I'm going to focus on a few that I've been personally involved with. Um, Kessel Run, Boston, Massachusetts, up there in the top right. It was one of the first um, software factories the Air Force really had instantiated a number of years ago. Uh, Kessel Run was really built to deliver combat capability that can sense and respond to conflict in any domain at any time, anywhere. And they looked at you know areas where, and one example they had is, is this refueling challenge um, that was managed through Excel files. There was, really wasn't a technology solution to get a piece of software built and then accredited in back to the security piece took, took a lot of time and they were lagging behind in requirements. By the time they got the requirement, built it, pushed it back out, the requirement wasn't valid anymore. There's just the turnaround time was 12 plus months. So Cus Run really started this process around how do we continuously deliver code and continuously maintain our authorization, our security approvals. Um, and a lot of what they done did early on, going back to 2016, 2017, really would laid the groundwork for all of these other organizations that you see. The second one I want to touch on is in, in San Antonio, Texas, down there at the middle of the map in the bottom, which was, you know, from a lot of the activities at Kessel Run, uh, another group was spun up called Level Up. Level Up is a cyber factory team for the Air Force and is the team behind Platform One. Platform One is the actually the official DOD DevSecOps Enterprise Services team for the DOD. So Platform One actually offers um, a repository of, of containers called the Iron Bank. It's containers that go through a really rigorous uh, scanning process and then receive um, a, a, a ABCs and ORAs, which are just like a, a accountant on their current state, their, their security status. And then and ORAs stand for overall risk assessment. And they give this the ability for product companies, vendors to come in there, have their containers go through this process, and then the containers that are in the Iron Bank are actually connected back to systems and environments that may require clearance, like security clearance. So this is an easy way for industry to now get their containers available in these classified environments where you might not otherwise be able to, to deploy your software. Level. What's interesting is that Dev, is that uh, Platform One also built uh, a Kubernetes baseline for DevOps. It's an environment that they can instantiate, and it's already got a number of tools in it, including Jenkins, uh, GitLab CI runners, CloudBees CI. Um, there's some security scanning tools like SonarCube in there. The idea is it's a, a Kubernetes container that we can that a customer can pull down and quickly instantiate, so they have a, a DevOps environment up and running. As these teams go out and spin up these new software factories, they can create leverage this repeatable model of kind of consuming these tool platforms that come out of it. The other one I wanted to touch on was uh, Space Camp. Space Camp is up in Colorado Springs, heavily connected in with Platform One. Its software factory focused on the continuous development and deployment of US, United States Space Force mission applications to the warfighter. It's a software node of Platform One, the DoD executive agent for DevSecOps we talked about. Um, and it's their continuous CICD um, platform that the Space Force uses, where they've built this open platform to, av to avoid vendor lock-in by uh, building this open platform using Kubernetes and Istio. They've embraced DevSecOps principles outlined by the, the couple different mandates that are out there, the DID, DoD CIO and the Air Force Chief Software Office considering microservices, mesh architectures early and offered often and leveraging kind of an event-driven behavior across their entire portfolio. And they really built also in doing that, that talent pipeline that we talked about at the beginning, right? Where they brought in this really good talent to be able to upskill and drive that. The one that I have been most recently heavily engaged with is the Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, that's the primary scientific research and development center for the Air Force. 
it goes by AFRL. AFRL plays an integral role in leading the discovery, development, integration of affordable war fighting technologies for our space, airspace, and cyber force. They have a group within it called Weapon One, and it's a digital transformation and modernization effort to apply the latest technologies to speed the delivery of infrastructure tools and data across their enterprise. They have the Weapon One digital, agile, and open ecosystem baseline some different government tech stacks of cloud-based engineering and lifecycle management tools, and a DevSecOps software factory there you'll see in the middle called Rogue One. Um, Rogue One is a group that we've been working with for over the past year now to help um, create this kind of idea around the software factory with the guardrails built in, the ability to have the insight and observability they need to get the security data out, they need to get their accreditations and, and push these applications out into productions. What's interesting is um, it's, like I said, it's really that kind of government-owned tech stack, but different groups can come in and build on top of it. So let's dive into what these software factories look like from a technical perspective, right? So, um, I'll talk about this and then we'll drive into kind of the five key areas that we want to we want to uh, cover today. So first, this is kind of a this is actually a, uh, from the DevSecOps uh, reference architecture that Platform One had put out through the Chief Software Officer uh, Office. This is an example of kind of the, the flow that exists today. And by working with a large number of government private organizations across hundreds of information implementations, we start to see several best practices emerge regarding software delivery and really achieving that increased quality, security, and speed of DevOps at scale. A lot of the enduring, a lot of the enduring success for these organizations happens when they fold their program management and government con governance controls into those DevSecOps processes around the tool chains that they have. So the programs start to benefit from greater management insight into performance, and they have an easier time scaling their automation initiatives, which really drives further efficiency. They also gain the ability to automatically gather data from across their DevSecOps processes and delivery pipelines. And then this data clearly shows them how they uh, are deploying quality software with speed. And ideally that data is, is uh, as close to real time as possible and collected continuously. This evidence is really vital for things like assessment and authorization, ANA, in accordance with things like the NISC risk management framework. So to know that your factory is producing worthy software or to pick up on problems that need to be addressed and create that tight feedback loop to ensure we're delivering secure capabilities. It's not just enough though to really merely tell us when there's a problem. We really need to trust that the pipelines are gonna automatically fail a build or a deployment that isn't up to, to the level of standard that we set. And this is one of the major benefits of automation. So what we want to look at today, what I want to look at, we're going to dive in here is five strategies driven by the software factory. So one, GitOps, right? Looking at configuration as code. Number two, we're going to touch on supply chain security. How that is, how do we address that as part of this construct? Three, we're going to talk about automating the release process. This really gives into to continuous delivery. And uh, I've got some uh, references there that I, that I want to talk about as well. That I think will be will, could be good takeaways. We'll be looking at metrics and value stream management which is a hot topic right now. Um, things like Dora metrics, flow metrics, touch a little bit on all that. Uh, and then we're gonna look at kind of the hybrid cloud, IT modernization, digital transformation strategies, and how does that tie into the software factory construct? And so that's what we're gonna get into, get into right now. So to start out with, let's look at GitOps. Configuration is cool. So GitOps Get Ops upholds the principle that Git is the one and only source of truth. GitOps requires that um, the desired state of the system to be stored in the version control such that anyone can view the entire audit trail of the changes, right? All those changes to the desired state are fully traceable commits associated with um, committer information, things like commit IDs and timestamps. This means that both the application and the infrastructure are now versioned artifacts and can be audited using the same gold standards of software development and delivery. GitOps is based on a Git-based source management system and hence like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, usually natural choices for, for code repository. So let's talk about having a declarative specification for each environment for a bit. 
When GitOps requires us to describe the desired state of the whole system using a declarative specification for each environment, this becomes that system of record. So you can describe your environments, such as tests, staging, production in a code repo, along with the application version that resides in that environment. And the relevance for software factories is kind of simple here. By having a declarative definition of the whole system, uh, you start to um, mitigate the complexity of tasks like audits and rollbacks. Along with those tasks, you allow the government to approach cloud migrations, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, much like a smaller, leaner organization would, because those declarative definitions mean that the infrastructure can be modular and really redefined across any environment or cloud. So it gives us a lot of portability. That additional flexibility, freedom, and governance empowers the software factory to serve a much larger group of programs. For example, we can describe everything in the Kubernetes model as a declaration. So the Kubernetes API server accepts that declaration as an input and then continually tries to drive or converge the cluster to the desired state described in that declaration. Next, let's look at GitOps beyond the app environment level. So when you think system management involves much more than just application and, and, and environments, it also involves open source and COTS tools, commercial off the shelf tools that intertwine together to create really this critical tool chain organizations rely on. And it's important these components also fit within that GitOps model so they don't inadvertently become a drag on our organizations and hinder their digital transformation initiatives. The CICD tool chain incorporates an important set of tools throughout that software supply chain that make up the technical backbone of the software factory. Often that consists um, of a, like a myriad of tool, or tech, tools and technologies performing a wide variety of functions. But at its core, the CICD engine really orchestrates the workflow from code commit through testing, deployment, and release. The situation, um, as we've seen, can become complex when there are various teams supported by the software factory that have diverse tooling requirements and workflows. So that starts to raise the question of how can the software factory satisfy those needs most effectively? What we've seen is configuration as code and GitOps enables them to do that. Uh, really where we see, where we firsthand, where I firsthand kind of been involved in that is around reinforcing the significance of capturing this, uh, of GitOps by capturing all that configuration as code. So because the foundation of our technology is Jenkins, the leading in the uh, industry leading open source CI engine, um, as a best practice, Jenkins jobs pipelines are declared as code. Um, the only thing there, the actual configuration of open source Jenkins instances, their pattern is a little bit different, but um, we add on some ability to kind of resolve that problem by capturing the controller's full configuration as code, some of the enterprise things that we kind of enhance on the open source project. But again, the idea there is that the code is maintained as a YAML manifest. It's stored within the code base, allowing the user to manage their CI solution the same way they would their infrastructure as code application code jobs with that GitOps methodology. So then this codified version within you know, CloudBees Jenkins means that software factories can trace that clear audible history with their CI CD solution. These configurations can also be used as modular portable installs, which can be provisioned and redistributed across teams and environments. So a lot of times what you'll run into in the government is, um, you know, we'll have some different environments that we have and we may even have a scenario where you have a contractor builds it to a certain point and then actually hands that over to the customer to put into their environment so moving across environments very common in these scenarios just the way that the workflow is done um additionally like this flexibility really allows us to the software factories to pre-configure and offer um, a leading ci cd platform from a catalog of configurations to find in yaml then teams can onboard rapidly and consistently thanks to the production grade definitions that are captured by configuration as code. Observability is really a measurable property of the physical system characterizes its ability of being observed. So like GitOps advocates system to be designed in such a way that they are easily able to be observed, explored, understood, Git commits related to infrastructure code and tools, allow organizations to have this continuous observability uh, over the current system configurations, upcoming changes and change logs, really reflecting a clear auditable path of what's occurred. Along with observability, controllability represents a major concept of modern control system theory. 
in order to be able to uh, do whatever we want with a dynamic sister system under controlled input, the system must be controllable. So observability goes a long way to enabling us to make sound decisions on how to control the system better. This includes the observability of the CICD solution, right? Managing this as code means that the software factory can observe and control the past, the current, and future state of that system. Let's talk about supply chain security now. Supply chain security is the, is was the second you know second kind of pillar we wanted to, to dive into. Supply chain security is is part of the supply chain management process that focuses on the risk management of external suppliers, vendors, logistics, transportation. Its goal is to identify, analyze, and mitigate the risks inherent in working with other organizations as part of that supply chain. The software supply chain is getting becoming increasingly complex and muddled landscape. A lot to do with dependencies, right? Like how do we maintain all of these dependencies that we're bringing in um, that are coming from other places? I think it's also new today, you know, most applications have 80% or more open source dependencies in them. So those dependencies become a real driver for that. Also, as we've evolved development strategies to things such as microservices, feature branches, and in that automation to increase velocity has made the security of the process a little bit more difficult. Emphasis on the supply chain security has never been import more important though, because if we look back um, over the last few years, there's been a number of them and you know, even one of the largest breaches in modern computing, see SolarWinds 2021, right? As a software supply chain is transformed, so must our strategy to secure it. Um, we think about security shifting, is shifting security from purely like perimeter defense to building security and trust self into that supply chain process. So the software factory should really have a method for generating evidence to include composition, quality, and security attributes. So we wanna capture all of it. We don't wanna just focus on security and not worry about delivering good quality products, but we definitely need to make sure that we're securing it along the way. One of the best practices we've seen emerge is for organizations to create audit-ready pipelines that generate the required evidence throughout the whole CICD process. And we'll dive a little deeper on that. So why is it important? A trusted software supply chain is critical to securely delivering these capabilities. And in the case of the government, I mean, everything is security focused. Everything has a security package attached to it in order to be released to production. An audit trail those components in action becomes really vital to ensuring that trust. All government deliverables from development contractors should include both the software bill of materials and the development quality assurance and testing processes and results of that. Um, the SBOM software bill of materials or SBOM provides the evidence uh, of what is running where, versions, third party libraries, open source dependencies. It's really that ingredients list of what's in our application, right? So that we need to respond or we need to identify what's there. We have, we have a very quick reference that we can go look at that will enable us to do that. And that evidence should be readily and continuously available to whomever needs it, whenever needed it, to pass audits painlessly, right? A typical supply, a typical audit process is lengthy, heavy on manual tasks. It's a hunt to recreate all the steps across the different disparate teams and tools. To conduct an efficient, accurate audit, assessors need visibility across the organization a detailed understanding of the path that code takes from the idea to the production environment. And without that, it's really hard to explain how things have progressed. This kind of evidence collection can and should be automated and continuous. And often we see agencies um, employing technology that helps automate that evidence collection and audit during the execution of every pipeline, stores it in an accessible database uh, for run insights, dashboarding, and and satisfying those compliance goals. The secure software supply chain is the foundation for continuous authority to operate, which is the government's uh, definition on when an application has met security requirements. And as part of that delivery process, it has to be documented and repeatable. So running the process, executing the pipeline is by definition compliant with the programs and their authorizing official standards. So that, that Authorizing officials sets the standards on what they need to do to meet that, that authority to operate, and then they can execute against it. A, software, a secure software supply chain really achieves the goals of both faster and secure compliant software delivery 
with less burden on the developers, operators, program managers, and the authorizing officials, because we've defined it, we've used automation to help make sure that we're staying, uh, staying in line with what we're trying to accomplish there. Trusted software supply chain um, goes beyond the security and integrity of the software being delivered to harden the delivery process itself, so the pipeline. So this isn't just about the items coming out, but also ensuring that that pipeline is secure as well. Make sure that we have that hardened process in place. That way the code is protected in the development during development by ensuring that the security scans are happening, dependency checking and other security measures are conducted um, past in our past prior to uh, promoting the code to the next stage. So think, so think about of you know, kind of creating these guardrails or these gates where different activities happen before it can move to the next one, but all of it's automated. So as long as we're meeting those thresholds, we're automatically moving to that next phase. We're just making sure that we have the right things in place to make sure we're making good decisions on moving to production and also that we're releasing secure, secure software. Software factory needs the ability to observe and verify the worthiness of any of the components within the supply chain at any given time. So achieving this is difficult without automation, right? Again, back to automation and a platform that can be used to capture the right data, surface the right insight for those that need it. And, um, you know, with the different tools in play, you kind of need some, an overlay to really capture, uh, capture that information. So to gauge, so we did, we did a little survey um, to gauge the increasing attention to software supply chain security, CloudBase conducted an online uh, global C-suite security survey of over 500 C-suite executives from companies across the U.S., U.K., Germany, and France. Um, all the all the executives expressed overall confidence in their security of their current software supply chains, but they also revealed ongoing challenges they face when it comes to dealing with emerging attacks. Security in the software supply chain can be a huge undertaking. So it's no wonder that almost three quarters of C-suite executives would rather deal with a natural disaster than with a security issue in their software. Like that's how big of a problem it's become, right? Well, there's certainly a lot of uh, lot to consider when you're strengthening your supply chain. It can help to think of the process like an infinity loop where security is baked into development, delivery and production, and we're building, testing, releasing, deploying, operating, monitoring, planning, coding are all really kind of part of that equation. That way we're securing every curve and crossover in this loop and ensures that we're um, fortified against some type of bad actor disaster. The idea here is we got to build trust and confidence in this loop by enforcing security, compliance, and best practices at every level within that DevSecOps cycle. This begins with the CI process, the way code's injected and initially built within the supply chain. Um, so really what you got to look there is how can we empower those software factories to build, distribute repeatable pipeline definitions, right? We want to make that repeatable so that we say, here's the definition we're comfortable with. The developers can go and grab that and begin work right away, but within the constraints that the organization set up that need to be followed. The more, the, secure, the more that we have security and standardization enforced on top of that funnel, the more efficient the software supply chain becomes. Um, you can actually go see the state of DevOps report. They touch on that as well. I'll talk about some data on that when we get to door metrics and analytics. Um, one thing to think about here, although this practice should result in production ready results, there is oftentimes some more work that needs to be done. So as software development has become more segmented with the evolution of feature-based development, microservices, the path to production has uh, in turn become more complex. An artifact's path to production is very rarely a clear linear path, right? Often it's relying on many intersecting paths, different dependencies, maybe multiple environments. And the software factory needs to uh, direct insights across all of those intersecting paths. Until this is observable and proven to be compliant, software supply chain can't really be secure or fully trusted. So this is where you look at, at like release orchestration, which grants that observability within the supply chain. You know, think about automating the collection of data across the tools that produce those release candidates and then aggregating that data in the form of a body of evidence that contains information required to either validate or fail the release. By having the continual insights across that supply chain, it helps us mitigate the risk associated with production releases. It gives us that direct insight into any uh, into any malpractice within the supply chain, 
and provides automated discovery or an automated delivery loop to resolve any issues that we identify. So a lot of this is achieved through multiple layers of compliance, beginning with the developer CI tasks, extending through uh, the observable release strategy, as we call it. Let's move on to the third item here, which is really around automating the release process. So we think about software factory should have a demonstrable, predictable, a really repeatable method for release automation that covers the process and configuration of software deployments. Whereas CI aims for speed, CD and release orchestration, call it CDRO, aim for repeatability and to ensure the worthiness of the software is getting and that it's getting where it needs to go. So think about if CI is analogous to, come to the conveyor belt, rapidly producing widgets, CERO picks up those widgets, validates that they were built properly, ensures they don't have conflicts with other widgets, put them in the right boxes, put those boxes under the right trucks, and drive those trucks to the right destination. CDRO is perhaps the most unsung discipline within software delivery, despite its profound importance. There's actually uh, there's actually a really good resource out there. Um, a group of folks, including uh, Brian Finster and Tracy Bannon, started minimumcd.org. It's a great resource. I recommend you check it out, minimumcd.org, because they believe that a minimal definition of continuous delivery CD was required to improve the flow of delivery and achieve the outcomes um, that you see on the screen. Actually, later, um, it's a project you can actually sign if, if you agree with kind of the, um, the minimum threshold they've set and kind of the concept behind it. I, I personally signed the project. And later, Dave Farley, most noted for continuous delivery, reliable software releases through build, test, deployment automation. He actually added his signature to this pro project as well, which to me just reinforces its core concepts. If you're an organization and you're going to be claiming to do continuous delivery, you really need to be doing these things at a minimum. Um, and a couple of these things are, and I won't go through the whole list today. Um, I Like I said, check it out, minimumcd.org. Uh, I think it's a great resource. But you know, there's there's practice minimums at a starting point. And the minimum activity to sit, claim you're doing CD is you're using a CI, you're doing continuous integration, right? And really, if you're doing continuous integration, um, our belief is that you need to be doing trunk-based development, meaning all changes are integrated in the trunk. They originate from the trunk, they reintegrate into the trunk, and they're short-lived and removed after the merge. Um, I also think that you know uh, things like integrating to the trunk. And on a you know minimum daily basis, there's just a number of areas. When we think about some of the high level, you know, a couple of the areas around minimum activities required for CD, like we touched on, the use of, of continuous integration, the application pipeline needs to be the only way to deploy it in an environment, and the pipeline decides the releaseability of the changes, and its verdict is able to be definitive. So these artifacts that we have created in the pipeline always meet that organization's definition of deployable, and I think that's important. Is that the artifacts created by the pipeline always meet the definition of deployable. Doesn't mean we're gonna deploy it every time, but it meets the definition that we've defined within our organization in order to really claim that we're doing this. And there's other things too, like rollback on demand um, that, that you know are part of that process. A lot of times, and why it's important, again, learn more, minimumcd.org. Why is this important for software factories? It is because government programs with substantial software delivery and scope should have teams focused exclusively on accomplishing, you know, CDRO, CDR. continuous delivery release orchestration, and the kind of automation needed to reduce long-term um, operations and maintenance on such program rarely happens at the task or the scrum team level. At best, you like kind of start to see uh, islands of automation, and as the program grows. The sprawl of disconnected team rapidly balloons program costs and can threaten government governance benefits of, of DevOps. So a couple of the following uh, elements of an effective CDRO capability are like pre-built release templates uh, that are automated, customized approval gates, control the pipeline, ensuring that each of those stages is reviewed by the appropriate channel before proceeding, right? And again, these can even be automated. Having self-service templates of standardized environments and pipelines accessible to the team, um, each operational environment should get a template that development teams can use. This ensures transition to operations is accessible because we're creating that repeatable path to production um, as an example. Further, you look at like release orchestration. 
this is just an example of, of kind of how we view release orchestration. But within our platform, we really look at how can you automate orchestrate orchestrate these complex software releases, the pipelines, the deployments, provide analytics, insights to measure track and improve the performance of that software factory. Um, we see again, like CDRO being a critical enabler of modern software delivery since its automation can accommodate things like person in the loop, control gates, testing of those outside CI processes. And really without it, the release process lacks that bigger consistency and governance, uh, which can make managing it a little painful. All right, so let's go through some analytics here. So when we think about uh, metrics, this is you know key point four, metrics and value stream management. Key performance indicators and management insights let program leadership really track progress and make sense of software releases in a, you know, we want to see in a consistent, reliable, repeatable way um, that don't have to be designed on the fly. Fortunately, Dora is a uh, DevOps research assessment has articulated four key metrics that we look at. A lot of you probably are familiar with these. We've got our mean lead time, deployment frequency, uh, mean time to recover and change failure rate. Those metrics assess kind of the throughput, the developer productivity and reliability, which together really illustrate the performance of that software factory. In the state of the DevOps report, Dora found that the highest performing organizations achieved remarkable results, 46 times more frequent code deployments, 440 times faster lead time to commit to deploy, 96 times faster mean time to recover from downtime, and a fire, five times lower change value rate, uh, change failure rate. Value streams are the steps an organization takes to provide a continuous flow of value to its customers and stakeholders, and, and Dora could kind of feed into that. The goal uh, underpinning VSM is to optimize software delivery by uh, revealing where the backlogs and dev DevOps waste occur. This is really important for complex programs where waste can disappear kind of the day-to-day -day activities. And if you want to monitor your performance using VSM, the software factory can align the entire organization around the goal of delivering that value. Software delivery metrics also come in many shapes and sizes, but traditionally in DevOps, they're guided by DORA, Flow, and or ISO standards, uh, a best practice. So, you know, flow metrics would be like flow efficiently, flow times. Those are kind of some of the higher value metrics we see more and more organizations uh, moving towards as time goes on. VSM is important to software factories because it uh, VSM and sensible metrics would enable a software factory to gauge their performance and prove out the improvements they've made. They can gain that real-time performance data to benchmark and track performance based on industry standards that we've talked about. And then it helps solve challenges like poor visibility across the, the software develop, delivery process, um, no connection between applications, teams, and tools means more uh, intensive error-prone methods versus you know, the, the opposite and solving the lack of information to track flow of value from idea to production are really the goals. Let's touch on number five, which is hybrid cloud digital transformation. So like we talked about, IT modernization is the key to reaping all the long-term value and benefits of running your applications, IT infrastructure in places like the cloud, right? It means continuous evaluation of your cloud applications, infrastructure and services to ensure they're optimized to achieve your mission and business goals. Continuous modernization results really in um, limited technical debt and the focus shifts from maintaining what you currently have to delivering additional value to your customer. The reason it's important for the software factories is because programs look to software factories for guidance, support, and modernization. Almost always this occurs because the programs themselves either lack the expertise, uh, the resources, or the time to achieve their modernization goals. These goals take many shapes, these can be things like cloud migration, DevSecOps maturation, adoption of new technologies. Software factories often, especially in the government space, are not afforded the luxury of offloading this burden. Instead, they're charged with accelerating each and every program's path of digital transformation. Um, this demand creates a need for solutions that can support things like modern container, Kubernetes strategies along time, alongside more traditional like main, mainframe modernization strategies. How do we deal with legacy or embedded systems? The harsh reality yeah. facing, facing the future of the government software factories that one size most certainly will not fit all, right? And that's one of the reasons we saw so many software factories uh, you know, listed in when we talked about some of the examples at the beginning. Most of them are purpose-built for unique uh, mission needs. 
So as we kind of come around here, full circle here, I wanted to kind of reiterate some of the benefits that we see. You have a team that guarantees all the profiles that your project requires, regardless of the characteristics that your project needs. A software factory will always have trained and specialized personnel to carry out your project. The specialization of the technology teams is an important differential, uh, differential of these software development companies. And so when we, again, go back to you know being purpose-built, right? My focus is cloud migrations. My focus is legacy embedded system or airframe, satellite. Um, because they're going to have different ways we ultimately deploy that code to them because of the different environment types that they have. Um, so we don't have to have 100% of the, the roadmap to start the project. We just need to have a first a clear idea of the problem. And that's really what Kessel Run did well, was understanding the problem and then working towards solving that. And the software factory team can start working on potential solutions. Um, times and costs are defined from the beginning. The use of agile methodologies throughout the entire process speeds up times and minimizes cost. And thanks to the experience of the software factory, professionals can accurately project budgets and development times. We start to see that incremental deliverables until the final product is complete. So we're getting things as we go. Um, and we constantly be presented with advancements, prototype, test units, as well as minimal vi viable products so that we can visualize dictate different incremental instances of that development process. And then your product will be finished without having to dispose of the total operating time around that technology area. It provides a lot of, a lot of great value. So really, as I close out here, as we're coming up on time, I think you know what I wanted to leave you with is as digital transformation scales up in large organizations, specifically government program offices and large government integration contracts, digital transformation faces a dawning set of institutional and human challenges. It requires new models of acquisition management, new models of organizational communication, and new methods of using technologies to manage people. Often these challenges include the requirement of the systems to be both cloud and traditionally deployed on-prem. And we recognize this challenge and how modern and, and modernizes the way we deliver value to both modern and legacy systems, because again, that's an important part of what these software factories are doing. These on and um, because of that, what we're really looking at doing is, you know, companies that don't embrace uh, are having the ability to have a continuous paradigm where end to end processes from idea to deployment is optimized, not having silos, having good handoff between the teams uh, really helps software factories embrace this DevOps-based culture uh, and knock down those silos they have uh, out there today. Uh, so with that, I appreciate your time. You know, again, we kind of covered how software factories use GitOps, how supply chain security is important, the role in automating the release process and how continuous delivery and release orchestration inform that, how metrics and value stream can really drive that, and ultimately how that really supports the digital modernization efforts. If you have any other questions that I'm not able to answer today, please reach out to me. Uh, you can email me, find me on LinkedIn, and then also I'll provide a list of resources where you can get all of the links that I referenced today as far as the strategy guides, minimumcd.org and others. So with that, I wanna uh, go ahead and wrap up here and thank you for the opportunity to come speak today. Right, thank you very much, Brian. That was brilliant. It was very interesting to see some of the insights on the line of work that you do. Do you have time for questions? I do. All right. Request to the participants we have today. What are the questions that you have for Brian? Please put them in chat, use the Q&A section, anything that you feel comfortable. In the meantime, I do have a questions. I do have some questions myself for you, Brian. Is software factories an extension of Agile and DevOps values? Absolutely, yeah. Software factories really look to leverage Agile as a core principle, leverage the DevOps methodology or methodology around bringing tools, processes, and people together to create efficiencies and automation. And so they're, they're a core part of what is needed within a software factory for it to be successful. Excellent, thank you. Jerome has a comment or a question that goes, where do you see the talent gap? Uh, do you have more context to add to that, Jerome? Where do you see the talent gap? That's a question. Yeah, yeah we do. I mean, so it's twofold, right? I mean, there's a talent gap on the side of hiring good developers. Um, that's one of the reasons these software, ecos software factory ecosystems exist to try to create a, a culture that is um, 
more similar to your Amazons, your Netflix, your Googles, right? Because those are the folks that are acquiring this top talent. So how do you compete with that? Um, you have to build culture, right? Um, talent acquisition around developers is difficult and talent acquisition around security. Security still remains one of the harder areas to recruit and find good talent. Um, the people that need to come in there that understand how security relates to applications. And I think that's the big gap. So I mean, the biggest one I see is probably around application security um, talent, where they have some knowledge of development and they have good knowledge of, of application security. Um, those are probably the roles we see most frequently. Thank you. Another one, uh, could you quickly the differences between SCA, Software Composition Analysis, and SBOM, Software Bill of Materials? How are those two related? Sure. So the they would actually they would play together. So you would use SCA to help inform a, an actual file output of an SBOM. So an SBOM is really just going to be a file output. There's two standard format, kind of two industry formats today: SPDX and Cyclone DX. You basically, um, your SCA tool would feed that information in. Your SBOM would be generated out. SBOMs have eight key pieces of data. It's always the same eight pieces of data. It's a standard today. Um, it's been the NTIA, the National Telecom Internet Agency, um, working with CISA, actually defined what the SBOM should be. I'm part of that working group. Um, but SCA would feed that data into the SBOM. The SBOM would just be that that eight different um, indicators, you know, like dependency name, the version, the date, you know, who are the contributor, who who owns it, um, those core pieces of information. So they would be they would they would be uh, one of the they would be uh, informing each other. Right. Thank you very much, Brian. That was also very interesting to hear that explanation from you. Another one is Iron Bank repository available for civilians or is it meant to be presented in an air gapped environment? It's available for anyone. So commercial organizations do leverage those containers. It's free. You just go out to uh, the Iron Bank website and you sign up. Um, they require you to do multi-factor authentication to log in, but anyone can sign up with an account. And then once you do, you have access to all the, the, um, the containers that have been uh, deployed there. And there's there's hundreds of containers, industry and government applications. Excellent, thank you. Another one, could you give some practical examples about how to embed DevSecOps into environments where only COPS applications are used? Yeah, that's an interesting one, right? So we actually do some of that. To, I have worked with some of that and even getting into like low code, no code uh, type of applications. There's still, even in those scenarios, there's still information that has to flow. So although you may not use the exact same tooling because you're not moving the same types of code artifacts, the processes and can still be very relevant in that, um, you know, we want to set up kind of what's our structure for how we want to make changes to that environment, and then how do we want to move through those steps. So I think applying the principles of DevOps more so than the tools would be how we most frequently see that. And with that said, there are still times where um, even with COTS products, when I bring them into my organization, I still may want to run a security scan on them. I still may want to, you know, make sure that we have a, a software bill of material so we know what dependencies are in that. So if there's a log for J. Uh, issue, we can go track down our COTS vendors that maybe have that in our environment and mitigate that. And with that said, you can start to use more of the release orchestration type tools to start to provide um, automation. When you bring in a COTS tool, the scanning happens automatically. We make sure that we've got our S bombs are filed away in the right area, and it really makes sure to main and own, own and maintain that that record of that information. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned ABCs and ORAs. Could you expand those acronyms, ABCs and ORAs? Yeah, the ABCs. I'm gonna have. I would have to. I, I said that, and then I realized I'm drawing a blank on the ABC part. ORAs is the overall risk assessment score. Um, I don't remember what the ABCs are. I don't remember what that acronym is. This is actually a new process. They just, Iron Bank just switched over that probably about a month ago. Um, and so it's something new industry is working with them on to kind of provide feedback as um, we all go through the process of bringing our containers up to those standards. Thank you very much. Another question from me. 
You mentioned that you were using pipeline as code on one of your Jenkins engagements. I was kind of wondering, were you using Groovy or YAML for Jenkins YAML. pipeline as code? Yeah, we recommend using YAML. All right, excellent. Are there any other questions for Brian? Last call for questions. Okay, there are none. Brian, thank you very much. And I understand some of the areas that you've touched upon today might itself be an hour length of talk in itself. We're going to invite you again, and hopefully you would oblige our invitation. You're anytime welcome here to present on some of the latest insights and some of your latest experiences. I thoroughly enjoyed the session. There's also uh, somebody from the Air Force member trying to follow you on LinkedIn. He has put that on chat. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. Brian, it was an absolute pleasure to have you here. We have recorded the session. It's going to be available on YouTube. Follow us on LinkedIn, and the recording links will be available just in a couple of days. Thank you very much. See you later.